I think that uh, I don't need this, right? that my presentation will be uh, probably a complement to the fantastic presentation we just heard from the minister. And this is part of a project that, actually two projects that I've been working on for many years. It actually started in UNDP. It had the title uh, Markets and the State and how markets and the state explain the dynamics of inequality in Latin America. And another project that I am now directing is called Commitment to Equity, Compromiso con la Equidad, which looks at fiscal policy and its impact on inequality and poverty. In, uh, right now we have over 30 countries globally, not just in, in Latin America that we're looking at. So um, I am, I was told not to press the red button, okay. But it's not moving. Uh, Tiago, where do I point there? All right, okay, so this is what I'm going to present today. I'm gonna share with you some of the facts. Uh, then, you know, the big surprise in the region, and Brazil is one very good example of this, is the amazing decline of inequality in a region that was known for being unequal, very unequal, the most unequal in the world. It's still the most unequal, but in contrast with many other parts of the world, it has been experiencing a decline in inequality. Uh, for now, I think to, to, since 2008, we, I call it my thriller. It's a thriller, and we have different seasons because now we're in the fifth season because we still don't know who really did it. We know there's many factors that helped the decline in inequality. And very interestingly, even though it happened in many countries in the region, as I'll show you in a moment, the causes are different in different countries. Uh, so and then I'm going to zoom in in Brazil, although you know this, uh, I am more used to work on, in Mexico. I am, my professional career took place for many years in Mexico. My, my husband is from Mexico. So I work a lot in Mexico, but we do have a lot of work also now in our project focusing on Brazil, and I'm going to share this with you. By the way, this project, Teresa was also with Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, whom you mentioned earlier in your uh, presentation about the multidimensional poverty index. Uh, and uh, the work on Brazil, some of it comes from people who are from Brazil, like Chico Ferreira and Sergio Firpo, and uh, my former colleague at Tulane, Claudine Pereira, who's also from Brazil, who's worked on the fiscal policy. So I'm gonna zoom in in Brazil and talk about labor markets and transfers, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of my main concerns uh, regarding fiscal policy in Brazil, which are some unintended consequences of fiscal policy and how they may affect the poor. So I am, I don't know who to point. Should I point you? <laughs> All right. It doesn't work, the facts. So let me go quickly through the facts. So everybody knows that inequality is high in Latin America, but it's been declining. The interesting thing, it's pervasive and significant. It is larger than the increase in the previous Decade means that inequality over as a trend has been falling. It has been an important contribution to the decline in poverty, this decline in inequality, and a contribution to the rise of the middle class. I still haven't gotten the, there. Okay, so this is, you know, the very classic graph that uh, Chico Ferreira and Martin Ravalion in a paper they wrote several years ago showed the different regions of the world and how Latin America is got the non, a very nice position of being the most unequal. Now, what we'll see is that Using the Gini coefficient, which you know probably most of the audience here is familiar with, but it's a measure of inequality. If it's close to zero, it's more equal. If it's closer to one, more unequal. 
So using that uh, measure, we've seen a systematic decline that on average was over 0.8% 8 .8 per year. It occurred in 16 of the 18 countries in Latin America, including uh, Latin America in the CEPAL definition, which includes the Dominican Republic. And the rate of decline ranged from 2.64% in Nicaragua per year to minus 0.28 in Venezuela. And here you can see, this is from 2000 to 2012, which is the most recent data that, that we have available. And this, you know, is, this is with a $250 a day, which is the extreme poverty line that is used in most of the comparisons for Latin America, particularly uh, for the uh, use by the World Bank. And there you can see how it's been rising in other parts of the world at the same time. Uh, this is the average of uh, the 18 countries, the weighted average, and in per capita income and equivalent income. So there seems to be like a plateauing process. However, the plateau is primarily driven by, oops, no? When you take out Mexico, the decline has been persistent. Mexico has seen some setbacks in the last few years, and that's uh, what's driving this plateau. When you take it out, you don't see it anymore. Um, here I show you how the average decrease, which is this green line, was higher than the average increase in the past. So there's no doubt that inequality fell. But it's still very high, so we shouldn't be delighted with the uh, situation, we should really push for further declines uh, in inequality. Here we're gonna show some um, changes in poverty and the rise of the middle class. This is also uh, for the region and how the incidence of poverty measured with a $250 a day, which is the extreme poverty line, and the $4 poverty line, which is the moderate poverty line for the region, how it's been declining over, over, the, over time. And uh, here we can see the contribution of growth and redistribution. Because inequality can fall without growth if you redistribute, or it can fall with just, what, what better one? So, all right, so, all right. Gracias, Tiago. Uh, so the red is the growth effect, and the other one is the redistribution effect. On average, close to 40% of the decline in poverty in the region is accounted for the changes in inequality, so it is very significant. Whoops, I think I'm not... Uh... ¿Qué pasó? No? Okay. So this is what happens with the, mid the middle class rose by quite significantly in Latin America and a share of it is explained also by redistribution. Obviously growth played a much more important role than with the decline in poverty, but it's also been very significant. Uh, Tiago, I don't know where to point. <laughs> Tell me. There. All right. Okay, so let me. So the interesting thing is, you know, because a lot of people say, well, I mean, maybe it's growth. There was a the commodity boom, and that's what explains the decline in inequality. However, it's been declining in both high growth and relatively low growth countries. Actually, Brazil belongs to the ones in the group of Latin America that has grown less and Mexico even less than that, and in both countries we ex see a decline in inequality. In countries that are governed by leftist governments and countries by center-center-right governments, it's been declining. In commodity exporters and commodity importers, and in high and low, by Latin American standards, inequality countries. So it's been very pervasive, and that makes it puzzling. Uh, so what are the candidates for the decline in inequality? I think they don't wanna, whoops. There is four things that have been happening and they all have contributed to the decline in inequality. 
I, I want to remind you the people that are here. Can you see this? Well, you can see the other screen, by the way. So there's been a decline in the inequality of hourly wages. There's been larger and more progressive transfers, which we saw now very well described in the previous presentation by the minister. Lower dependency ratios, particularly the decrease in the dependency ratios was more concentrated in poorer families and higher participation rates of adults. Uh, oops, now I wanna go back. Well, the blue, the blue is labor markets. So a lot of what is behind what happened to overall inequality in Latin America, the decline in overall inequality, can be attributed to a decline in inequality in hourly wages. The orange is transfer, so the other, that's the other one that's been very important, and the yellow is other type of transfers, which for Latin America in many countries are remittances. So for Mexico and Central America, they play a very important role in terms of helping inequality fall. These are two different methodologies. So we show that the results, they vary in size, but they are very robust in terms of the causes and the rankings. Now let me zoom in Brazil labor market. And there's some results that are very puzzling to us now, and we're working on them actually with one of my students. This is what has happened to the Gini coefficient over quite a long period, coming from 81 to 2011. Inequality rose in the, you know, the time that you had hyperinflation and crisis here. Then it declined a bit, but really the big, big decline starts at the end of last decade. And it has been persistent, and if you continue to draw the line, you probably find that it has persisted. It's happened overall for income uh, per capita for uh, households, which is the yellow one, and for labor market income as well. The important thing, something that was stressed by the minister, is that the decline in inequality and poverty happened during, but particularly the decline in inequality happened during a period of rising wages for everybody, rising incomes for everybody. Not exactly every, everybody, and that's what I want to show in a moment. There's been important demographic changes in the population in terms of participation in the labor market. There's been an increase in female labor participation. There's been an increase in the Africa, Africa Afro-descendant, Afro-Brazilian population. Uh, there's also been a big push in terms of upgrading of education, the percentage of people with lower grades is declining, the percentage of people with uh, greater achievement is increasing. Uh, here you can see this is the composition of the um, labor force in Brazil. You can see how the people who have secondary and tertiary has been systematically rising, incomplete primary and primary has been declining, so you've had a major shift in the composition of the labor force in terms of educational achievement. And you can see that the returns, which are the wages, the relative wages of people with different levels of uh, schooling, have been changing accordingly. They've been falling. People who have complete primary, complete secondary, and complete tertiary the relative declines have been, the relative wages have been declining vis-a-vis -vis those who had no schooling or incomplete primary. And that's one of the processes that is behind the changes in inequality. Now, one interesting fact, and this is something that, like I said earlier, we are beginning to study because we discovered it recently, is that college-educated workers in Brazil Mexico have experienced in decline, not only in relative wages, but also in their real wages, which is a new phenomenon that we're trying to understand. In Mexico, we have more information of what's, what kind of process is behind, but here we see that in Brazil, that's the case as well. So you have one group that has not experienced growth in their average wage. 
we don't know if it's the younger cohorts or the older cohorts. In Mexico, it's the older cohorts, not the new entrants to the labor force. So something to study, see who is being affected by this. But today, James, in the morning said that you want to have inequality falling with no, nobody's income falling as a cause of this decline. And in both Mexico and Brazil, we find that one group actually does not fulfill that condition. So we need to investigate. This is not necessarily good news, right? I mean, so we need to focus on this. The other thing that is, is good news, and it's important in terms of policy, is that you've had an increase in the formalization of people participating in the labor market, something that Teresa mentioned, and also a rise in the group of people that are earning more than the minimum wage. The minimum wage, which has been a policy variable, as was shown earlier, has systematically increased. As a matter of contrast, I'm not showing this here, but in Mexico, the minimum wage has been flat since 1990. And you still had a decline in inequality. So that's why I was saying they're different stories. But in the case of Brazil, the labor market story is that you've had a contraction of the gaps between different uh, sources of wages and also redistribution of the characteristics of the workforce that moved in the direction of generating more equality. Uh, one interesting fact that we find in Latin America systematically is that the educational upgrading, the fact that you have a more equal distribution of education, this is very paradoxically, so pay attention. It's not equalizing, it's unequalizing. Why? Because you have different rates of return, different wages for every level of education. So as people move up the ladder, you cannot redistribute education dramatically from one year to the next. You cannot say, this person has primary, I'm going to give him a tertiary education in one year. They have to go through the ladder. As this ladder proceeds, you have a process in which the mm, educational up upgrading can be unequalizing. This is still true in Brazil at the moment, but this is something that will disappear when the differences in educational uh, achievements get smaller and smaller, because then you don't have people down here. But in the meantime, it's unequalizing, and that's what you see here. So, had the relative wages not been compressed, you might have seen a slight increase in inequality. The main driver of the decline in inequality in labor markets has been the compression of wages. Now, what has been behind this uh, process, you know, we see that average wages increased, the real average wages of less educated, less experienced, rural and poorer workers increased, but the real average wages of the college educated declined. And what can be behind this? There's been an expansion of education, so there may be an effect of increasing supply of people with higher levels of education that brought the uh, skill premium down. You had an agricultural export boom and you have invested a lot in terms of getting agricultural uh, uh, incomes higher and this is something that is showing up in the results. The rising of minimum wages and formality. And then the big question, I mean though this has been studied are okay, we know the drivers. What we don't know is what's going on, why the absolute real wages were workers, for workers with tertiary decline. Is it because it's the new entrants that have a different quality in terms of a degree in uh, university education? A mismatch, Nair Neves has been working on this. Is it obsolescence of skills of older workers that are being displaced then by the new ones? So this is in the, on the research agenda now that we need to understand. Okay, what about the transfer side? That's a labor market story. And in general, it is a pretty 
happy story except for what happened to the college educated. So let me, let me, let me go fast. Uh, we know that uh, by, you know, there's a lot of work by Barros uh, Pebe, as he's known here, on the transfers, and the transfers were very equalizing in Brazil. Uh, now I'm going to show you Brazil. This is a snapshot in comparison with other countries, not over time, but how does the FISC, how does the fiscal policy affect inequality and poverty? And let me do it quickly because I think I went over my time, my allotted time. And uh, I'm going to show you now what happens. You know, market income is before the FISC comes in. Then you have direct taxes, la impostos a la renda. No? Then you have the direct transfers, which are Bolsa Familia and the other uh, transfers that are received, like BPC, special circumstances, pensions, etc. And then you get to disposable income, which is a measure that is being used to assess the progress that Brazil has made in terms of poverty reduction. And in, okay, so this is a graph that shows the change in the Gini coefficient, the decline, how much did it decline due to direct taxes and direct transfers. We have countries for the rich part of the world and we have developing countries. The red one is South Africa, which does a lot of redistribution, as uh, Murray was describing this morning, and it's actually amid the, the richer countries. Then here, after Greece comes Chile, then comes Brazil, and then comes uh, a bunch of others. This is you know, a part of our project, the commitment to equity. So Brazil does quite a bit of redistribution through its fiscal system. Uh, now what happens when you add, whoops. Okay, so here you can zoom in just for the countries in the developing world that we have covered. Now what happens when we add the effect of indirect taxes, consumption taxes, and other indirect taxes and subsidies. Well, inequality in uh, some countries, the effect of subsidies dominates, like Mexico. So inequality continues to fall. In Brazil, it rises a little bit. And it also rises a little bit in South Africa. So even though they're slightly unequalizing, the effect is very small of consumption taxes. That's not a problem. Also, when you look at you know, where do the net payers to the FISC start, meaning we get transfers, or I mean, you get transfers, Brazil, and you pay taxes, direct taxes, consumption taxes, you may get some subsidies. The direct payers to the FISC in Brazil start uh, around the fifth decile, which isn't bad because it's beyond the poor. However, uh, oh, and another thing, another interesting thing is when you add, this, this graph shows how much you can decline inequality when you monetize services in education and health. So Brazil does a lot of the reduction in equality if you value the services at government costs. And that's an important component of its reduction. Uh, but let me now move to the, and I mean, you know, I think also Brazil does better than other countries. This is income per capita, how much you reduce the Gini in, uh, before and after the taxes. You can see that Brazil is above the trend line. It means it's doing better than the average. And it's also above the trend line when you compare with different initial inequalities and you compare that with a post-fiscal inequality, Brazil is also above the line, so it's doing better than the average of the 16 countries. But let me now, and I finish now, Jorge, so don't worry. What is the uh, unintended consequences of fiscal policy? In our work, the main concern that we found with respect to Brazil and other countries is that when you introduce the effect of consumption taxes, 
poverty actually increases above market poverty with a $250 a day. So let me show you that graph. This is before consumption taxes. So this is what shows what Bolsa Familia and all the work that the federal government is doing to reduce poverty. And Brazil comes out really at the top, okay? Now come the consumption and other indirect taxes, many of which are at the state level. So you have a problem here because you would need to coordinate all the states to change this. This is what happens. So this is Bolsa Familia and all the other transfer programs. Poverty gets reduced. When you take into account the effect of consumption taxes, poverty rises above what it was before the fiscal system came in. And I think that's the main challenge that probably the Brazilian government that's so highly committed to reducing poverty faces. I don't know if those numbers are exact, because you know we use data from 2009, so we did not simulate Brazil's and miseria. We could. But I think it is an issue that deserves undivided attention, because you have a system that, you know, we know it's not very efficient either, the, the tax system, but it may be anti-poor at the level of the indirect taxes. And it's not the federal government's fault because you have been de decreasing the, the taxes, how the poor have to pay taxes on basic staples, but the system, it's a systemic problem that probably needs to be addressed. And I think it would be very interesting if there would be uh, an attention given to this issue with a new government coming in to see whether something could be done. Because in addition to the problems of distribution, you have to also deal with the macro constraints, headwinds that are coming to the region, as we all know. And so this is going to be a very, very tough task. And I think that uh, that's why I wanted to, to show you this, because I think it requires, like I said, undivided attention. I will uh, show you one last slide of something also that is important as a conceptual, <laughs> if you allow me to be professorial for a moment. A lot of time people talk about regressivity in the tax system. Uh, regressivity usually refers to changes in inequality. But you can have a tax system that is inequality reducing and poverty increasing. This sounds strange, but it's not, because you, know, you can have taxes that are high for the poor, but much, much, much higher for the rich, so it would be inequality reducing, but poverty increasing. And I show the example in our uh, sample of 16 countries that we've covered so far in the Commitment to Equity project. That's the case of Ethiopia. Ethiopia has an increase in poverty, even though the fiscal system decreases inequality. So in any event, messages, taxes, how do they affect the poor, particularly consumption taxes? I have here the references and all the teams that work in these uh, different countries because it's a lot of work and I always like to show what they did. Thank you and obrigada. My apologies, Jorge.